have to be with Mas Maslow, you've come across him before. Maslow. Yeah. If you haven't, send me an email, I'll send you some stuff. Okay, so Maslow, um, it's a theory in, in psychology. Uh, just a theory. Which we'll go through. In 1943, uh, Maslow pr proposed a theory uh, which involved these various stages, these various needs. He studied people he called exemplary, such as uh, Roosevelt, Einstein. So he studied people to see what they need and what they need differently, their motivation. Uh, Maslow was what we call humanistic. Okay? He had a humanistic approach, um, and that was almost like a rebellion against what some psychologists uh, at the time were what they called behaviorist and, and psychodynamic psychology. So at the time, uh, humanism was something different. Um, they believed in, it was almost the third force in psychology, uh, where you had psychoanalysis and behaviorism, which we'll sort of talk briefly about in a moment. Um, but they thought in humanism, you, you, you rejected the assumptions of the behaviorist perspectives. Behaviorist, we talked about just a little bit, um, where you had the likes of, say, Skinner, you had the likes of um, uh, the, the Pavlov, Pavlov, sort of, after Pavlov, you had the likes of uh, Rayner, Watson as well. So that was sort of behaviorist, which we'll go into a bit more detail. But humanists rejected the psychodynamic approach. Uh, the psychodynamic approach was all about uh, childhood hood memories, about going back in time, the, the childhood memories, uh, reflecting, being an analysis, things being rooted in time and so on and so forth. Uh, the humanistic Maslow, he was like, okay, you've got five stages of human uh, motivation five stages of behaviour. And the stages were, we'll have a look now, is physiological was the first stage. Um, then you had the second stage was safety. Um, then you had the third stage was love and belonging, self-esteem and self-actualisation. So the humanistic approach is about free will. Okay, You could choose. And that was different to psychoanalysis and behaviourists. So the humanistic approach, you could grow, you could change. You could make a difference. Um, individuals could develop and be the best they could be. They could self-actualize, was Maslow's theory. Um, we want to actualize ourselves to our highest potential. As human beings, we want to actualize ourselves and be the best we can be. And, and that was the difference between, say, Freud, who was very psychoanalytical and, 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 and deterministic, where deterministic theory was the unconscious mind, in the way Freud put the unconscious, not the way we talk about conscious hypnosis. Uh, his theories was based more on individuals rather than people collectively. So the humanistic theory uh, focused more on the conscious. Okay, you could change, we can change, it's possible to change. The humanists thought that people are inter inherently good. So Maslow thought, well, people have got good in them. Okay, people are inherently good. Um, they want to improve, they want to actualize, they want to change. That was his theory. Um, it was called the third force of psychology after psychoanalysis and behaviorism. So that's when sort of the humanistic approach come in. And the likes of, you probably heard, uh, you know, Rogers as well. Um, and they placed little value. Uh, Rogers and Maslow placed little value on scientific uh, psychology at that point in time. Especially used in laboratory, they used to use a lot. So used to, the likes of Skinner would use the lab a lot, animals a lot. And behaviorism, I mentioned yesterday, the movement really began in 1913, when you had the likes of Watson. Uh, prior to uh, Watson, you had the Pavlov dog experiment we talked about before, the classical dog conditioning. So what, um, what Watson would done, he, he wanted to get more of a science base. Uh, he wanted to be able to prove things. He was looking for more scientific evidence. Um, and what happened at that point was, you had the, the, the Pavlov dog experiment, so the classical experiment we talked about yesterday, the stimulus was the food, so the food was the stimulus, um, and that caused the dog to salivate. The food was an unconditioned response, and the bell was neutral, a conditioned response. Okay, so what Rayner would do, we talked about yesterday, was the little Albert experiment. And the little Albert experiment I mentioned yesterday was taking classical condition further, 
So loud noises were considered unconditioned stimulus. The loud noise uh, was unconditioned stimulus, and and the, uh, the the that linked to the the rat uh, became a like a dog a conditioned stimulus where the loud noise was unconditioned because the baby was frightened of the loud noise anyway. The rat he wasn't afraid of, but he became afraid of the rat when he heard the big bang. The same as the dog. The dog would salivate unconditionally with the food, but he wouldn't do anything with the bell. But when you ring the bell and you put the food, uh, the dog starts to drool just at the bell as well. So the two, and, and, and they associate the, the neutral uh, with the negative loud noise. So the, the rat that was neutral originally, um, the food that was neutral, uh, the bell that was neutral originally starts getting associated. And that's sort of uh, behavioristic. Um, and for me, when you look at um, the behaviorist, that's what they, they base uh, behavior on, more the environment. Okay, so what choice do you have on your behavior? What choice do you become on who you uh, decide you want to be? Um, if we are conditioned, and we're a product of environment, and certain stimulus of the environment, then what choice do we have? And where Maslow was different, uh, he begged to differ. Now we could change, we could actualize. Okay? Skinner took classic conditioning one step further. Okay? And he did operating conditioning. So operating conditioning is different than classical conditioning. Okay? And we won't go into the details today, um, but Skinner was considered the father of uh, operating conditioning, and he, he was famous with doing experiments with, like the pigeons, the, uh, the, the the rats as well in the box and so on and so forth. So the behaviorist thought we should study uh, psychology through an objective lens that re requires more hard evidence at that point anyway. Um, and, and the humanistic was different. So Skinner would use um, behavior as reinforcement. What he would do was um, look at behavior as motivation, focusing on, on desired motivation, and he'd be like, okay, he'd use a positive reinforcement um, or a negative reinforcement. Okay. And we see that at school, for example, so the positive reinforcement could be, okay, um, you go to school, you go to school and you do your homework and the teacher says, you know, well done, he, here's some sweets for doing it, or he, you get an early mark for doing it, a reinforcement. The negative reinforcement could be you go home and you don't do your homework um, and your mum says, we're not going to play. Okay, so it's a negative reinforcement. You know, you finish your homework and there's a positive intention behind it to do your homework, but it's a negative reinforcement. Um, and that sort of was, was Skinner's operating conditioning, which is different to the classical conditioning, but classical conditioning uh, requires change in the, the, the timing of the response. Okay, so the, 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 the bell rings, and you associate the bell to the food, then you move the food away, and, and the dog still salivates. The baby as well. Um, as well, you put the rat, He's fine, and then all of a sudden, the bang goes off, and he links the two together, and he's afraid of the rat, or he may look similar to the rat, and that would impact the behaviour um, of of, uh, of um, the uh, individual. So that's sort of where we are with that. From this point of view, uh, what Maslow would say is um, you would have to actualise one level to go to the next level. Okay, so. Your first need would be physiological. Okay. What do you think would be a physiological need? What would be a need that we, from a physiological point of view, what do you think would be a need that we... Uh... Sleep. Okay, and yeah, food. anything else? Food. Food, we need food, okay. So they're physiological needs. Without food, without um, sleep, without basic needs, uh, then we're not gonna actualize to the next need, which is safety. What else do we need when we've got food? What else do we need when we, uh, we've got uh, our basic physiological needs met? What else do we need then? Shelter. We need shelter. Okay. We need shelter here, but the shelter we have here as a physiological need becomes a bit different when we get here. We want to make ourselves more uh, comfortable. Okay. Um, so the humanistic approach will be all individuals are motivated to achieve their potential. We go through the gears, so to speak. 
um, it was individualized. So then you look for uh, a better shelter. Okay, you, you look for a bit like say, if you watch the film Castaway, Tom, Tom Hanks will cast away, he ends up in this wreck. What's the first thing that Tom Hanks does? Physiological needs. He builds a, a bit of a shelter, doesn't he? And then what he does, he builds a bigger home. So your safety then is imminent. Um, because what you do then is that you decide to build a nice environment for yourself. A nicer, and also safety from the point of view, who locks their doors at night to keep you safe. Okay, so then you decide, well actually, you know what, I'll build myself a nice, safe environment where I can lock my doors at night and I'm safe. Okay, once you've got that and you achieve that, um, under the right circumstances, uh, we all cultivate. It's like, for me, it's like planting a seed. And you plant a seed like a flower, you plant the flower in the ground, and under normal circumstances, you cultivate it, it's going to grow and blossom. But we know that there's a lot of determining factors in the flower growing because it's got to be watered. If the locusts come, it won't, it won't grow. If, if the seed gets trodden on, so we know there's barriers in getting there and actualizing. So barriers can get in the way. But once we get safety, the next level is love and belonging. It's not enough just to uh, have food in your belly. Um, it's not enough just to have safety. What you want then is to, 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 to have love and belonging part of a group. Human beings don't like to be on their own or don't do well on their own. We like to have love and belonging. Okay. When you think about uh, primarily, uh, we used to be part of a tribe. The best chance to survive was part of a tribe. If you weren't part of a tribe, what were the dangers you think you'd have out there? Another tribe, the dangers of animals roaming the earth, and, and we like to have that love and belonging, that family network, the culture in sport. Because you might think, well, what, what's this got to do with anything, really? What would I use? Well, you see this used in sport, in business, in academic environments. Because if the child doesn't have food in their stomach and basic physiological needs met, and they're not feeling safe, like I mentioned yesterday, safe is the big thing, then they're not going to go through the gigs. Okay? Um, so providing people with an environment where they can grow and, and learn from experiences goes a long way to, to self-actualization, which is going to be the ultimate goal, to work our way up the pyramid. Then once we get love and belonging, you've got your love and belonging, you're part of a group, you're part of an association, you're part of a family, then it's esteem. You've got an esteem need. Um, and the esteem need is, um, it would be feeling good about yourself. Why do we do what we do? Why do we do anything? How do we evaluate things? So esteem could be uh, we, we, we adopt a certain profession. Esteem could be we help people, uh, homeless people. Esteem need could be um, we become a member of an organization. We do things to feel good about ourselves. Okay? And once we actualize that, then only then we go to self-actualization. So once each need is met, we go above and beyond to the next uh, need. So we have food in our belly, we, physically, we, we have basic needs that are met, sleeping, basic shelter, we then go to safety, we build a nicer nest, a nice environment, we lock the doors at night, we keep ourselves safe from all these various factors, from environmental factors, from any dangers, people roaming the streets at night, then we go for love and belonging, we join the group, feel great. Um, then we sort of look for esteem need. And then the pinnacle is sort of unleashing that force within, that self actualization. Now, all things being well, we can go through the gears. But there are barriers that get in the way. Um, so, as you grow into self actualization, it's removing the barriers that get in the way. Um, and also, before Maslow passed away, to throw a span in the works, he talked about once you actualize, it wasn't enough. You sort of wanted to give back. And you see this with certain people, like the Mother Teresa in this world, and that sort of stuff, really, where they, they actualize, but it's not enough then. It's about giving back. Think of people throughout the history of the world 
you know, the JFKs and other terrains. I'm sure you can wrap a whole list of them that you're aware of in your own mind. So self-actualization ain't enough. And he, he sort of threw his fan in the work before he passed away and mentioned that. But equally, uh, that's not to say that um, that's not to say that uh, we 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 everybody actualizes. So uh, Maslow's theory was not everyone gets to there because of various barriers. But what do you think one of the challenges are with some of these models? What do you think that um, one of the challenges when we have these models? What do you think one of the the, the, the challenges are? Uh, I would on on the third one. Any, any stage theory, by the way, yeah. any stage theory doesn't mean you can't give back yeah. at any stage. And also, we can be in any stage simultaneously. So let me give you an example. Okay, great point. Okay, let me give you an example. You, you go to work one day. You, you're actualizing, you sort of, you, 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 you provide for your family. You're all eating well. You're all sleeping well. You sleep well at night because you lock the doors. You're all safe. If it's really, really hot, you've got the air conditioner. If it's really cold, you've got the central heating. It's beautiful, everything's fantastic. Um, you've got a loving family, you've got belonging, you're a member of the local sports club, love group, okay. Um, you've got this esteem, this status in society of being who you are and what you do. Okay, you, you, you've got a strong sense of self-esteem based on your belonging in the community. You, you're sort of, you know, giving, you're seen as this sort of person, such a sort of wife. You're self-actualizing, um, you're looking at uh, your own growth, and, and maybe even beyond that, you're looking to start to give, to give back a bit too. So maybe you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna find ways to help people less fortunate than me by doing a, a charitable trust, and I'm gonna go out and help people, give food to the homeless, I'm gonna go out there and, and help people, okay? Then you go to work one day, and you lose your job. You rate redundant, but you still got to keep the same payments. You still got the same lifestyle that you want to keep to, but you've lost your job. Now, if you lose your job, does it mean you go home? Your family doesn't love you no more. Does it mean you don't love each other no more? But what it does mean, what do you think you're going to be reading if you lose your job? Are you going to be reading philosophy, or are you going to be looking for another job to provide for that? Because all of a sudden you got bank knocking on your door. You've got mortgage payment to pay. You go to the shopping center, they're not gonna say, well, actually, you can have food on credit. You've got to pay for it. And, and your, your emergency fund's in the bank before you break into your bank and you uh, use the money you've got saved up for your, your kids' university or whatever else, or, or to, to, to buy the holiday home, whatever you've got as a nest egg, you use your emergency funds, and you're down to here again. And that's the issue of any stage for you, where it's not to say you can't act you know, one or the other, but the point being is that with stage fear, yeah, you can get to there, but obviously life circumstances can have a big impact on our life. So the point being is that, yeah, you actualize and you've got to go through the gears and you've gone through, but then you get made redundant. Your priority is not going to be reading philosophy. Your priority is going to be to read the paper and get a job or how people get jobs these days. Does that sort of make sense? Okay, that's, that's pretty powerful stuff. So from that point of view, uh, we, we readjust our life in order to our priorities. So the priority is then, like in Castaway, the film, is to eat. The guy, the dude's on an island. He's got no food. He's got to deliver these parcels, but he's not worried about parcels at that point. He's not worried about um, uh, anything else at that point. He's worried pure survival. I've got to eat. He's probably never caught a fish, fish in his life, but he's, he's, he's spearing these fish. He's eating them raw, okay? And he's built himself a little little uh, shelter to save him from the elements, but then he, he looks beyond that. And then he falls in love with Wilson. Well, precisely. <laughs> precisely, big advert for, the, uh, for that and the, the, the uh, company that delivers the uh, stuff. So, so, you know, once uh, we're satisfied, then we do uh, move up uh, the various needs as we achieve that, but you can see from Castaway, well, okay, then he builds the fire. Yeah, you're right, exactly. You know, he, he gets the ball and, and so on and so forth. So, according to Maslow, his theory was that people don't achieve uh, the inner potential, 
people don't actually get to that peak experience. They might have an epiphany. They might have a moment where on holiday they're sitting by a pool and they have a, an epiphany. Or they might be with family and have an epiphany. Or they might be at work and think, okay, I can be something more here. But according to Maslow, he would say that um, most people don't actually self-actualize. Uh, and it, it is a humanistic theory uh, that you come up with. Um, and that's not to say that uh, any model is 100%. No model is. You take out of it what you will. You can't scientifically prove 100% that this happens. But that doesn't mean that it's not a useful model. You don't need to prove things uh, scientifically 100% because we can't really prove anything to a point 100% for it to be useful. But it is a great model to use. And I have a bit of reflection and think, okay, um, what are some of the ways that you could use this model in schools? How could you use this model in education? Any ways, you know, from an education point of view, what could you do? I think, I think, it, I think that this model and how it seems to me yeah. it very much fits with the modern way of kind of living, this lifestyle that we live now. Yeah. It fits perfectly, you know, to help people become better people to live in a functional modern society. That's, that's how I see it. Yeah. yeah. It's important to know where people are. Isn't it? So you, you look kids and where they are in their school and where they come from, yeah. and knowing people and knowing knowing their support and their background, and then, then you know what level they're roughly at by knowing them. Yeah, because the, the, we talk about psychodynamic and behavioural. That's the notion: you are what you are. It is what it is. Here you've got the opportunity to grow. So, in view of that, from an academia point of view, yeah, for sure, you you, you want to make sure that the 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 eating they've got their basic needs met. And you think that in our society. In our society, there's a very good chance they'll have that. There's a very good chance they'll have that in our society, or at least they should have that in our society, but the means for it in, in our society. There are some countries around the world that's more of a challenge. It depends on where the school is, because that represents primary school education today and how it's changed, and yeah. it's actually rather than schools focusing on actualization and getting the children to a development stage. They're spending a lot of time on one to four, uh, because yeah. actually children are coming in and they're not in some of the areas they're in abusive homes yeah. they're not getting breakfast they're not safe yeah. they're not loved and they're coming in with self-esteem issues and it becomes why yeah. they can't teach them Pre precisely that's a great point and, and bearing in mind that in some societies from a physiological point of view survival point of view um, the father eats first and the reason why the father eats first because the father eats first there's a bigger chance the rest of the family will perish Okay, so you can see how things, uh, the environment can influence to a point and what goes on around us, but that's a great point. But if you're not eating well, you're going to find it hard to study. Okay, if you don't feel safe, you go home and you don't feel safe, you don't feel safe in the environment and at school, you're not going to flourish very well. You don't feel a sense of belonging. So the, the notion of meeting one need and then sort of going up the gears and meeting the other need and um, it is a very powerful thing. In sports, the same. In sport, um, you can cross, you can bring the model into sport too. Uh, when you think of sport and the environment in the club, I've had lots of young players join us from other areas, other clubs who you know been involved at a high level, but at different clubs. I'm looking at them and I'm thinking about one current player in particular who's only been with us six weeks, and his sense of belonging to where he'd previously been was non-existent. Mm. So he's so such so low on confidence and, and, and esteem. And the big thing that we're trying to do with him is realise the difference in our level and our yeah. environment and our club together and, and how you know how we that sense of belonging within the club that we're at. So it's not necessarily he's got plenty of love and belonging with his family, but not what's attached to his, his sport. Yes, no, no, it's pretty yes, experience. Yeah. Yes. And by, by understanding ourselves and our circumstances, we can actualize the, 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 uh, the needs and move up the gears. The better understanding you've got of yourself and of ourselves, we can actualize the, the needs and move up the gears. We, we become more self aware. Okay? Because if the, very, if the first needs are being met, we've got water, we've got sleep, um, we've got what they call it in behavioral terms. 
primary reinforcers. Okay, uh, once we've met that, then we can be motivated to go to the next gear if we work on the basis of this model. You try studying with no food in your stomach, or go for days, uh, or work functionally. Okay, so once you've got that, uh, then the next one is to be protected from the external circumstances. So, so here, and then you're looking for protection now, safety from the outside world. So you, you start to feel safe, and you've got food uh, that you can eat, you feel safe, but then you lock your doors from the external element. You protect yourself from the, the, the elements. Uh, it could be warm, it could be cold. The external, you, you've got a nice cuddly bite to be in. So from, a, from an educational point of view, business point of view, they've got a nice environment to be in. They feel safe. Okay? They feel they can, they can, they can speak. They can voice uh, any concerns. They feel okay. It's a safe place to voice your opinion, to talk about that. Um, and then we can move ourselves to that love and belonging uh, we're part of a community, so, so you make the, 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 the education, the young people, part of the, the, the school, the community, um, part of a group, belonging, that love. In a sporting environment, um, it's imperative. How are we sort of frame love as being, but um, having that sort of family environment in a sporting establishment is key. Well, you want to treat each other like family if we're in the same team. It's imperative to be part of a group. We can fulfill that. Then we sort of go to our steep needs. Um, and that's sort of our motivation to compete, um, self-respect on peers, uh, social status. Um, so you've got all that. Then you go to actualization. And, and the humanistic theory was you become all the best you can be. You realize your full potential. But only when you've achieved all these will you achieve your full potential. And like I mentioned before, Maslow Bruce Spanley work is when people got there beyond self-actualization, uh, it's about giving back. That was you know, what he said just before he, he passed away. Um, but like I mentioned, over any stage theory, uh, you could be uh, in different stages simultaneously based on life events. But getting an awareness and understanding of where you are can be quite useful for your own development, but also as a coach, it's quite useful too because you know where other people are in their own stage of development. That's not undermining people saying that, okay, if you feel that you're actualized any less than you or any, any worse than you, people are where we are. We've all gone through the gears, all of us, from the day we were born, uh, we didn't get to here through life circumstance and events. And in one respect, we're quite fortunate to have been provided the opportunity to grow up in a, in, in, in a, in a country uh, where we've been able to have pretty much these. There are some people around the world who don't get the same opportunity that we get. Because they, they don't have that. In some countries they don't even have water, sanitation. In some countries in the world they don't have access to food. I know it's not you know, perfect where we are. Uh, of course it's not, and neither in Western society, but we know for sure we've got a good chance, or the best chance possible to achieve that we've got a good chance to achieve that too. Much better than a lot of places. Uh, and then beyond that, we can sort of uh, work our way through and become the best we can be. And once we become the best we can be, then um, we go out there and, uh, and give it our best shot and go from there. But what I want to do, um, before we sort of... Uh, can I just make a comment of course you can. on here? We speak like this and it's, uh, everything we're saying is right, but I don't watch reality TV because I think it absolutely sucks, but it's interesting yeah. to watch these I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, yeah. and see when you, 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 you take that, that model there, you put them all together in a little group, or take the shelter away, mm -hmm. take, take the surplus food away, and just give them little scraps, mm -hmm. how quickly you become something else mm. because one little element has been taken away yeah. and how they all scrap to go for the bottom one to work in what they want to back up again. Yeah, very much so. And what I find quite interesting is all of those people who go there, they've all reached that place where I'm a celebrity, I'm sticking rich, I've mm. got everything I need. Precisely, yeah, yeah. How they deliberately go out and 
give it all away in that time frame of the, the competition. Yeah, that's a great point. But then you look at the human behavior and interaction and how a lot of them say, yeah. geez, I found myself, I've learned so much. Yes. It just tells me, it doesn't matter where you are, take one of them away and there's a discovery that takes place. Oh, that, oh that's a great point, fantastic point. And, and you know, any, any state model, we can be in different places simultaneously in different situations, can have a big impact on where we are. Like I mentioned earlier, so the guy who's, who's providing for his family got the job, loses his job, then he's not going to be reading philosophy. He's going to be trying to find a job to, to get, you know, to, to make sure he's being met again. On some level, have that as well. That's a great point. You use the template, you transfer it across the environment when you get people who are strict of everything um, that they have and they put together an environment and they, they go through the years again. Because you're right, exactly. They're, they're somewhere in the world and they're working towards here and, and, and that's being met and they've got this, that and the other. And, and you're right, you, you pull something away and then it's quite interesting to see. And I think there's a great observation. I think there's a great observation. I think these models are useful. They, I, you know, you take what you want out of them. Nothing's cast in stone, nothing's 100%. Uh, we don't know for sure that this is the case, but what we do know, we can get some use out of it, as you mentioned there. And I think we do cover a couple of other models on the next two days, which is quite useful too, that link to that too, which is great. And that's the beauty of some of these models. You can sort of sit down there and think, okay, I'm gonna take what I want out of it and apply it. And you'll see this in business, in sport, in education, uh, quite uh, heavily. You'll, you'll see, I think that what, what I'm finding really interesting is one of the things that I've been wanting to, to learn about and shedding a lot of light on the things that I maybe I've not understood about life is Yeah, so, so the yoga model you were saying, if you just sort of... Yes, yeah, so the yoga model, you, you've got your root chakra. Okay. Which is how when you, um, when you start to, uh, or when you sort of journey on self-growth, you're supposed to start at your base chakra. Okay. And that is, that's your home, your spine, okay. what okay. makes you feel, what makes you give okay. your purpose and who you are. Okay. And that's, and the, the, what the problem is supposed to be with today is that we focus so much on what, where we live, what makes us say mm -hmm. that, um, that, that can how actually the realisation that we still can have love for ourselves and love for everyone else regardless of where we live or how things feel. We can um, have that um, the self-esteem movement from, again, from yourself. Everything is supposed to come from, mm -hmm. from yourself and no matter what the situation you've been in, like you said, you've got control over it and um, changing whatever maybe has happened in the past that you can still go to be that even though you've not had it at the beginning. In a perfect world, you would do. You would have had that someone else for you, mm -hmm. but obviously we don't have that luxury nowadays, like you said, with, with people living in that situation as great as our own. Um, yeah, if we but were but this, this model is, 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 is giving me a good understanding of actually of the world that, that we're living in now. I think and so. How to navigate around it. Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's quite useful um, for ourselves as well to know where we are. In, in any given situation as well. We understand ourselves better. Um, we understand who we're working with better. That's quite useful too to know where they are. We can implement aspects of the model and transfer it across to uh, specific situations, whether they be uh, work, whether they be uh, in an environment at home, our personal environment, our home environment is quite useful. For your own home environment, it would make a lot of sense if you have a family and you've got children to provide them the environment they need or do the best you can, 
of the environment they need to actualize and be the best they can be. Uh, as a parent, you want the best for your children, do the best you can. Now, as much as we want to do the best we can for our children, there's things that we don't control as well. And that's the hardest thing. I mean, we all want to give our kids the best education, the best health care, the best life we possibly can, but there are barriers in the way of achieving that. In the world that we live in, it's quite competitive. You know, a lot of people go for the one job. I might want a professional sports person, but so do many other people. doesn't mean I'm going to be a pro sports person. If I'm a pro sports person, or I have a good, a good professional job, I've got a better chance of actualizing these needs to a point, one would think, um, it's going to make a big impact. So we live in this world that we live in at the moment, and we've got barriers in the way, just like I mentioned before. You know, you, you, you plant, you plant a, a seed, or you plant a harvest. If nature works the way nature is intended to work, it's going to grow. If I can nurture my seed, if I can plant seeds, plant a harvest, plant a tree, plant a flower, and, and, and water it, if the weather conditions are right, if the soil is right, if it receives the amount of sunlight it needs, um, if the birds don't come and eat the seed, it doesn't get destroyed by the locust, it's going to grow. But that's idealistic, isn't it? Because we know that it's not as easy as that. So, yeah, in the right environment, we're underway. So I might want to, as a manager, do the best I can for my staff. I might want, as a parent, do the best I can for my family. I might want, as a teacher, do the best for my students. But I know there's certain constraints getting in the way of achieving these. But I guess in saying that, what the humanist believed uh, which was different to the behaviorist, is that we could change. We could, we could find a way to navigate beyond this. As human beings, we have capacity. We're not just classic conditioning. We're not just operative conditioning. Okay? Uh, we, we are and have got these emotions. We have got these feelings too. So we, we treat people um, like people. We, we are the sum of all things, but we can also find a way to actualize. And having actualized, we can be the best we can be. Uh, and then beyond that, obviously, we can also uh, go to that level of, of, of giving back too. Uh, but very few people, according to Maslow, um, actually got to here. Well, from his point of view, uh, according to Maslow, if you read the literature, not many people actually got to here. Um, so according to his theory, if we didn't get to here, we probably wouldn't be the best we can be. So it would make a lot of sense when we're sort of planning and, and, and structuring things and providing uh, classrooms and uh, to, to, to have something like that in place. What would think to help people become the very best they can be in whatever environment? Um, before we do an exercise, and we'll, we'll do uh, an exercise shortly, is there any, any, any questions on, on the process? Any, any thoughts on the process as well? Anyone, anyone find that the process of any, any use? Yeah, from a coaching point of view. Yeah, it's quite useful, isn't it, to sort of think, okay, uh, we can utilize that. Um, can anyone think of their own journey in life where you think you might be? You, you don't have to say where you are, but just a bit of self-reflection where you think you might be on this journey at this moment in time. And, and, and if you reflect back on your life, are there times that you've sort of had to almost simultaneously to readjust your life accordingly. So you lose a job, um, you have a breakup in a relationship, uh, you, you have circumstances beyond your control, and you have to, okay, um, sort of readjust life. And you're more self-aware. And, and going forward in life, life being the way it is, you can, okay, there's gonna be certain situations where things aren't gonna stay the same. How can I provide myself the best opportunity to get here? be the best version of myself. So how can I do that? Uh, it's easy on paper, but practicality, you know, we're all one day away from our life being turned upside down. The cast away, we're all one day away from, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But equally, the beauty is, we've all got the capability and the resources to be the, to bounce back. Because we've bounced back before, each and every one of us in this room will have experienced a situation in our life where we've had to readjust our lives and we've done it before. We've done it before we can do it again. And that gives you a lot of the confidence to think, you know what, I've done something before, I can achieve it again, I've bounced before. 
we've lost jobs before, we've broken up before, things have happened before, but we've bounced and carried on and kept going. But the majority of people in, in Western society would hover between three and four now. Yeah. And, and all the little hurdles in the way or yeah. little things in the way just nudge you down a little bit and you'd like to, I suppose you'd like to think that the majority of people in the West would always be above safety, but I know we're not, but you know, the majority would be, wouldn't we? I would potentially challenge that, to be honest. I mean, there's a huge, huge disparity in terms of capability to keep food, to as well as education. You know, if that weren't the case, why wouldn't we food banks and problems mm -hmm. in the society that are? When you go yeah. within a, you know, within a strata yeah. of, of society, then yes, yeah. people would be able to keep food. Yeah. The reality is many people yeah. in our society struggle for a number of reasons yeah. around the one and two. They're two really wonderful observations that you've made there. They really are. The reason being, you just given me just a, a, a epiphany at the moment. Um, having mentioned that, uh, you are right to a point. I think you'd like to think in our society, we kind of, for the most part, we might balance in that relation, we might balance in this situation, we might balance in our jobs. Um, but it's pretty much, generally speaking, we kind of look after that. There are people out there with food banks, are people struggling, but for the most part, you'd like to think that most of our society eats and sleeves, but what's quite interesting what you mentioned there, I watched a video one time, and this is fascinating, we're going to throw a spat in the works before we, <laughs> we break for lunch and move forward, I watched a video one time, it was quite interesting, it was in a big city, I think it was somewhere in America, some big city, I'll try and find the video for you and I'll send it to you, and there was this young child on the streets who was homeless, or appeared to be homeless, okay? and was crying, saying that they were hungry, okay? I'm gonna throw this out there to you. How many people do you think stopped and helped this? Few, okay? One person did, okay, one person did. And do you know the person who helped this young man was? The homeless person himself. If you look on YouTube, if you put in social experiment in the search thing, it is riddled with things just like that. Everywhere. And you find that the people who are most needy yeah. in a lot of ways, as far as food and clothing is concerned, it becomes the most generous. Yeah. It's pretty powerful but stuff. I think that, yeah. that's no different in wartime, yeah. how everyone speaks about the yeah. three club together. Yeah. They, you know, when people are all in, in a situation of stress and trauma, then there is more likelihood so from an actualized point of view, you'd like to think that there were going to be enough. There's going to be, in a big city of millions of people, you'd like to think, and I'll, send it, I'll find the video, I'll send it to you. Um, it was a TED talk, actually. It was quite fascinating. You'd like to think that in a big city, there'd be someone somewhere that's actualized enough to do something. To take one minute, even if it's just to get a phone and call the authorities to help this young person in distress. You'd like to think there was someone actualized enough to do that, so you've got to ask yourself sometimes to think the only person who did anything was someone that was on the street themselves. Now I'm not saying that's going to happen everywhere you go, I'm not saying that you go on the streets here that the same is going to happen anyway, but it does make you think. It does make you wonder sometimes. So that's quite fascinating. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd throw it at you, uh, having gone through all these changes and, and just when you think you've got your head around it all, thinking, okay, I'm going to use this blueprint on the way. <laughs> Look what I, well that, that sounds like more like my blueprint. <laughs> <laughs> that one. <laughs> fascinating, isn't it? It is. Really I, I think there was another yeah. video too, it was quite yeah. interesting too. Some guy, uh, there was another video too, he, he, he was walking the street and, and he had a baby, holding a baby. And this is quite fascinating too. That, they showed a guy that was dressed really, really uh, poor and scruffy. And he had a baby. And he's walking the street with his baby in his arms, saying, can I have some money to buy the baby some uh, milk, please? And because he was like dressed really, really rough, he looked like he hadn't slept for days, everyone was like, go away. One guy like spat at him, get lost, you know, sod off, as you do, as people do. <laughs> that, that was in the major city in the States as well too. It was a really fascinating video that I saw. And you don't know how much this is staged, you don't know how much of it's real, not real. We don't want to sort of um, silly enough to think that all that we see on YouTube is real. We don't know, but if we go off what they showed um, and the hypothesis, and ironically, when they had another guy who was dressed really sharp, really, really well off suits, really good looking guy, tall guy, really, really uh, buff. He walked out of a Lamborghini, a really, really sports car, and it was quite ironic when he asked,
some money. Well, I've left my wallet behind. People were giving. And ironically, at the end of it, there was a woman that said to this guy, this guy could I have you done for please? I was just giving me money as well. <laughs> That's quite fascinating to think, you know what? Isn't it a funny world that we live in? So in terms of actualization, perception, and so on and so forth, it's quite fascinating. So I want to sort of close on that note. And you've got food for thought now uh, to think about. But hopefully, uh, by going through the model, you know, you've, you've, you've taken what you need out of it. And, and uh, yeah, certainly we'll have some lunch and we'll come back and dig in some exercise and go from there.